some poems from my chat book, and I brought copies for sale. If anybody yeah. likes what you hear, you can buy a copy. Um, then I'm going to read a couple newer poems, too. Am I close enough? Can you all hear me? Can you get closer? A little bit louder? There you go. Okay. Close enough? Yes. All right. Um, the first poem is called Reassurance. A poet once said that we are like the clouds, never existing separately, never maintaining one shape. Each day to the next, I suckle differently, mother. Death breaks hearts with caskets and cremations dust. Men who will love me with roses and rivers will fall into the eyes of others. Sisters become mothers. Lovers can rape the soul as easily as the body. Fathers are not always what a child's eyes see. I learn your breast, mother, like the footpaths of my hand. I nurse to be fed the cream of your body. I nurse to find comfort, resting my head to sleep. I nurse to hide my face within you. I nurse to wash you clean with my tears. We are not the same women born with my first breath but I lean on the memory connecting this moment to that. I swell out my breast to you, for you have known what I have only begun to learn. And then this next poem is the longest poem I've ever written, um, so uh, I hope you guys like it. <laughs> um, it's called Mother. Packing boxes without thought, 20 years numb from fighting the manic depressive disease that plagued a life promised at 23. She could have done without the children's space so far apart. Seven years plus seven years plus seven years, 32 before they would have been alone again. The illness that forced him into darkness made him a nomad in a paranoid state, stripped him naked and weak before her eyes, a chicken plucked running through the yard fearing death but wanting nothing less. The two-room apartment with the bathroom floor that gave way to five bodies in and out every day. The refrigerator on January 26th, her birthday, end of the coldest month. One bottle of ketchup, a mayonnaise jar, and a rotting apple to fill the whiteness. She could have lived without the lottery tickets that promised the things his illness stole from her. The diamond ring he wanted her to own forever the dress that flowed in a graceful swirl, the house they owned, three bedrooms and happiness that trickled from the children's laughter as they played Barbie and G.I. Joe on a red living room carpet while he was in Ohio State University's psychiatric ward, scanned and probed, glued to metal wires and batteries that surged electricity through his temples, testicles, and torso to rid him of the demons that spoke through the Thorazine, Paxil, and Zoloft. She could have walked on streets paved in gray instead of those fully beaten ways, littered with Pepsi cans, cigarette butts, and bums talking to air. Unshaven, forgotten prisoners of a war he fought to ward off the stench of rotting flesh that ate a soul that could not eat. Men who shook and wobbled, teetered on brinks with eyes that saw through passersby, with stares clouded by the chemicals that followed an abnormal wave. Men raped and shuddered, bumped and thundered, echoed voices that turned on gas and lit a match, exploding lives to ash, voices that pulled triggers of shotguns held an arm length away, barrel kissing mouth, voices that hungered fluoxetine, lithium, clozapine to quiet them. She could have worked a lifetime without the stroke that sent her to bed for two months, a weakness she could not stand, legs that could not walk for street to the end, a year of physical therapy, him taking care of her, sweeping her carpets, bringing her pills, washing her dishes, cooking her meals, drying her tears, walking with a cane at 5 a.m. before the rooster woke, before the doors opened and the town came to life to watch her struggle. The Sunday she walked two blocks and collapsed from joy, tears staining a face already stained with life. She could have married a man who wouldn't have died at 51 leaving her a widow before their 32 years had come. Her, a mother, a wife without a husband, three children, a poet, a politician, an undefined prayer to love her, not quite as much as he, but to remember, but to remind her of his hair that shone like a night collected with stars, a 
a nose that breathed for two, his smile, the white picket fence they always owned, his eyes that in youth shone like polished leather boots, more brown than the dust that covered them with age. Yes. And this poem, um, the next poem's a little more fun poem. Um, <laughs> it's um, in the voice of a little kid. It's called, I Want a Big Mac. <laughs> Daddy gets a Big Mac, tells me I'm too little. I stick out my lip and open my eyes wide. I'm not too little. One day, I'll get a Big Mac. I'll be big, tall as my daddy. No one will say I'm too little. I'll talk about Cold Wars and Hot Wars. <laughs> Harry's true man and vans going in galleys. I'll sing in church row in the top row with my daddy. I'll get greasy black under a car held up by a jack. I'll bake the best white cakes just like my daddy. I'll have a chair that lays down. Sitting in it will make me smarter than the newsman on TV. Mm. I'll learn the dances I can't do on daddy's feet. We will jitterbug and mash potatoes all night. And I won't let and I won't marry a boy who won't let me keep my daddy's name. <laughs> yeah. And this next poem is um, my husband's favorite, so I always like to read it. Um, it's one of my favorites too. It's called Flower. Worn like a tender childhood buried in briar bushes, sunk into swampy green Appalachian ponds. Dogs get to see as much and more. August 1983, you nearly fell from the Ferris wheel. I nearly tumbled trying to save you. Mom said to leave you on the ground, but I knew that you wanted to see from the top. In dog years, you're 112. We got ready to start school together practiced reading about rabbits, deer, and hedgehogs. Sitting in self-exiled corners, you filled my lap, watched the page as I taught you the letters I knew. Named Flower because I had just seen Bambi, mm. the only flower I loved through my years of painting black over everything pink and skirted. Stuffed animals do have souls. Yeah. Kindergarten, you lived in my book bag because you wanted to learn too, and I needed you. There's some dirt that mom and Tide will never get out. Call it love wounds, scars from the mountains, the tree limbs you fell through, scratched eyes that look like tears, a flattened nose that sniffs to the left. I promised you that I would never stop holding you at night. I did not understand how grown-ups could give up their toys for one another. Mm -hmm. um, this one is called Reassurance 2. Love does not stand still for long. Like an overactive child, she breathes movement from and into the air. I do not want to spend the rest of my life with you. We have shelves on the wall, towels, blankets, Christmas decorations in the closet. I can count the passing seconds by the bathroom faucet drip. I painted the bedroom pink because I never felt pink before we met. Mm. A ring is a toy you can buy for 10 cents at Mr. Fun's. A vow is a phrase we say every day. I love you. There is no wanting here. We have already begun. Yes. And then the last poem from my chapbook is called Nephew. Your father's eyes droop, crooked smile, must hair, greet sleep with dreams of your scent. Your mother has not washed her hair in three days, fumbles her breast to your mouth. Eyes closed, she smiles at the sound of your suckling. I am too old to envy sleepless nights. I fail at babysitting because I have never used a bottle warmer. <laughs> I do not have a bassinet, so you sleep in a laundry basket padded with towels. <laughs> I hold you to my chest and read words you do not yet understand. You and I will eat ice cream for dinner. 
I will read Winnie the Pooh nine times in a row until you fall asleep in the curve of my arm. I will not tire of finding Nemo marathons. I will let you splash in the bath until you are a plump white raisin. I will buy the lightsaber your parents refuse you. My love will not be marred with discipline or contingent on an eight o'clock bedtime. Your pointy tongue like mine, your slender fingers shared by your father and me, your great grandfather's blue eyes, your dark hair like everyone before you are legacy enough for me. Yes. <laughs> Now for the poems that I dropped on the floor. Um, no. <laughs> um, this first poem's a series of haiku that make the poem. Um, it's called Hospital Flicker. Hospital flicker, white linoleum, body, bed sheets, breath, heartbeat. Newly braided flesh like Indian burial mounds covers your veins. Your eyes melt me like pooled lava. I stopped your blood, not your pain. My tongue, a cocooned butterfly tangled in silk of its own wanting. Take my hand in yours, like vines twisting in lattice we grow from the ground. Unfinished, you can move forward. The widening road breaks the forest. Um, this next poem is called um, The Last Train. He felt the pool of steel, promise of a speeding train, a body meant to carry the tinder and coal of the world without the splintering of bone, metal hardened like a heart, a heart too softly born, bearing love's weight, love's secrets passed like rumors and kidney stones. He wanted to meld into steel, fracture the radiance of an engine's headlight. He luminesced dark pages, hands cupped in prayer. Any one of us could walk into the night, find wind rush steel softer than human touch, lighter than the grace of a feather, throw ourselves wet with life, blow our thin glass skin over flames, melt into steel. And this is the last one I'm going to read for this part. It's called The Knowledge of Apples. His eyes float in ponds like eggs, fresh cracked in a bowl, glistening, wet, slipping away from center, receding like bonds broken. He comes to the waiting room, comes quiet, comes with the image of blood spilling like concrete in the street. Pray, he says, bring a priest to negotiate, transubstantiate. But the women waiting know it takes blood, bowls of blood, rooms of blood, rivers and oceans, wombs of blood to create. She tears like fresh paper, opens like Vesuvius, cascade of smelted stone to destroy, to preserve. She could pull a train, peel the earth's crust, shatter diamond houses, her breath strong as gravity. He imagines she will break from the ground, intestines and lungs spilling to the floor like altar offerings, her heart following the flow of afterbirth, he cups like a shallow dish, steadies with his hoof hands, roof-damaged, wind-scarred hands. Twisting, he comes, a war correspondent crossing borders, knees bent to the ashed scent of blood, carrying news like an armful of dead soldiers, carrying the words on his back because his mouth is full. His eyes swell with the knowledge of apples. Thank you, guys. <laughs>